I'm going to preach the part two of this, what I tried to finish last week. Um, so I want to make sure that we we finish this. I know last week we uh, kind of got into the first part of it, and I got kind of stuck on the word repentance. <laughs> and for some of us, that's a dirty word. It makes us uncomfortable. Well, if it's a dirty word to you, that makes you uncomfortable. Good. Should. <laughs> Amen. Um, because repentance has to do with dirt in our life, sin in our life, uh, things that are unpleasant, uneasy, things that makes us uncomfortable, and uh, allowing God to remove those things out of our life so that we can serve Him and, and, and be able to do what He wants us to do in, in, uh, for His kingdom. Um, but what we're talking about is what is an outpouring of God, or what is a move of God. And so last week we talked about, you know, the fact that in order to have a move of God, one of the first things that we have to do as believers is we have to live in the Spirit. We cannot be these people that just come to church on Sunday and then be in the bar on Monday. That don't work. That's called hypocrisy. That's, called, that's not called being a Christian. That's not called being saved. That's called being lukewarm and cold and indifferent to the Lord. That's right. But when we live a life that is spirit-filled, when we live a life that is in the spirit and we're doing and obeying and loving God as God wants to him, God wants to be loved, not as we want to love him, but as God wants to be loved, which means through our obedience, when we begin to do that every day, God begins to do things in our life and shows up in ways we never thought or imagined. And you say, well, does that mean it's based off of works? No, it's based off of relationship, but that relationship requires obedience. That requires us to have intimate times with Him and it requires us to live a life of repentance. And so a life of the Spirit, a life of living in the Spirit, a life living after God is constantly being aware of my life and what it is in my life I might need to clean up. And so yeah, that's kind of a tough place to be for some of us. Because you know Paul talks in Corinthians when he writes to the Corinthian church and he says you know I can't come to you as spiritual. I have to come to you as babes. I have to come to you as immature. And the reason why is you have divisions, you have dissensions, you got all this fleshy junk, gossip, all this fleshly junk that is among you. He says, I can't come to you as spiritual. He says, I wish I could. I wish I could share you the deep things of God, but I can't because you're not living in the spirit. And so Paul challenges them to grow in God. And when you read the second book of Corinthians, he has a different approach with them. He's able to speak to them on a different level because why? They were able to repent. So living in a life of the life in the spirit, that's one of the first things we've got to do. It's not, it's not a suggestion. It's not something that, that God says, okay, well, you might be able to do this or you might get to heaven on the skin of your teeth. No, like we talked about last week, living a life in the spirit is a requirement, a biblical requirement of a Christian. So we can't just go through and just say, oh, I said a sinner's prayer, and all of a sudden, oh, I'm going to go to heaven. It takes a lot more than just that. You've got to have a relationship with them. This morning, I want to go into the second part of this. You know, we kind of talked about repentance in the first part, you know, of uh, living a life in the Spirit. And, you know, I could spend a whole two or three months on that subject alone, and I'm not going to exhaust you with that this morning. And, but... I want to get to the second part this morning that's really burning inside of me is what is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? You know, we, we look at different words and, and a lot of these words are man-made. The word revival, the word awakening. You know, you look at the Old Testament and the Old Testament talks about being revived. You look at the Old Testament it talks about being awakened. But when you get into the New Testament, you don't find such words. You find outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons why is because in the Old Testament, and if you've gone through any of the study I've done on, on the Holy Spirit, we know that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people at times, but never lived or resided within. It was never designed that as a Christian that we would need to be revived or awakened. You hear what I'm saying? It was never designed for us as a Christian that we would have to be revived or awakened. Why is that? Because you revive something that is dead. Something that is dying. But if, you have, if you're a born-again Christian and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, that means you're supposed to have life. Well, how do you revive life? You can't revive life. It's already living. 
And so you can't revive life. And so the, the, question that you, the question you have to ask yourself then is as a Christian, if I feel dead, if I feel dry, am I living that life in the Spirit? That's the first question I have to ask myself. Is am I living that life in the Spirit? Now when you look at the sinner, obviously, you know, we don't see the words revival. We don't see the words awakening when it comes to the sinner either in the New Testament. We see the word repentance. Mm -hmm. And so they have to come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through repentance. So before I get into this this morning, I want to pray, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to show up in a way we've never expected. What he's going to do, I don't know. Let's find out. Father, I ask right now that you would enter this room in a way we've never experienced. Yes. Holy Spirit, we invite you here. Yes, Lord. You are a promise from the Father to us from the Son. Jesus, you told us you would not leave us orphans, but that you would send the helper, the counselor, or the paraclete, as it's called in the Greek, to come alongside of us, to counsel us, to lead us into truth, to strengthen us, to gift <coughs> us, to empower us. God, to take us down the journey, Father, in victory. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is a promised gift thank from the Father to us. God. And we thank you for that. Because we know that you have not left us orphans. And as a result, we are adopted. And Lord, the Holy Spirit is able to testify with us that we are yours. So Father, we thank you for that this morning. We thank you this morning, Father, for visiting us. And Lord, I just ask right now that you are sending out pouring here in our homes, in our yes, church, yes. and throughout St. Joe. Holy Spirit, come this morning and do what you want to do among us. We want you here right now. Right now. Father, when I read the book of Acts, and I see how people prayed and places were shaken. I see people praying. And the Holy Spirit comes and fire happens. Lives are changed. Father, we're hungry for that. We want that here. Father, we're not dry, we're not dead if we have life of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So, Father, help us to be like rivers of living water, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we have to ask ourselves, you know, when you go into the book of Acts in chapter 2, and I, and I love these these. this this. this verses in chapter 2, 1 through 4. And the reason why I love these verses of Scripture is because this is a fulfillment of the promise that Jesus made to the church. And it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a, of, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided, divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Druze, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. Now, isn't that interesting? God shows up and something gets confused. Well, what's confused? Confused, confusion here that is happening is not the power of God among them. The confusion is that when the power of God happened, it took them out of their element. Mm -hmm. You hear what I'm saying? So why were they confused? They were confused it's because this isn't church as usual. It confused them. It confused them. Because everyone heard them speak in their own language. Well, what is going on? All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit shows up. They begin to speak in tongues. People begin to hear the gospel in their own language. And all of a sudden, God does some amazing things. They're like, what in the world is going on? What is going on? So let me, let, me, let me give you some things real quick about what is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I think before I go into what is an actual outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I want to go into what it is not. And I think this is really important to understand. First thing that we have to understand is that a whole, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not church as usual. It's not about our preferences, our traditions, or our opinions, or any of that. It's not church as usual. When Jesus left the disciples in chapter 1 of Acts, there were 500 people that were walking among them. 500. 
Jesus told them and said, I want you to go back. I want you to tarry and I want you to pray. I want you to seek the Father and believe God for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, out of those 500, there was only 120 that actually listened to the Lord. The other 380 aren't there. They're going back to do, and in the Jewish custom, they call it Shabbat. That's S-H-A-V-O-U-T. I think I spelled that right. Which is the Pentecost or the festival of weeks or festival of harvest that is going on. But out of these 500, only 120 go to the upper room. Only 120 say, you know what? I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get the promise that God has given me. I don't care what it looks like, sounds like, tastes like, smells like. It don't matter to me. I've got to go after it. I've got to get this. But 380 went back to church as usual. Now, when you look at that number, what does that tell me? That's telling me that when God shows up and God is wanting to do something, He will always have a remnant of people among the midst of a crowd that says, I want it regardless of what the rest say. Mm -hmm. Pretty powerful thought. And I tell you what, I want to be one of those 120. I don't want to be like the 380. Amen. I want to be one of the 120 that goes back and get that. So the majority went back to church as usual and missed out on the prophetic outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Think about this. All 500 could have witnessed this. But only the 120 was able to witness it. Because only the 120 was willing to get out of their element and listen to the Lord. The question, just in that little short thing there, is we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to be part of the 120? Or are we going to go and be part of the 380? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. The second thing is, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not a return to the way things used to be done. Now for some of us, that makes us uncomfortable. But when you look at, the, when you look at Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit shows up in a powerful way, they could not go back to what they used to know. Because when the Holy Spirit showed up, He did a new thing among them. He did an amazing thing among them. Matter of fact, when the Holy Spirit showed up, He showed up in such a powerful way, He messed up everybody's practice, history, and ideas of what church was supposed to be like. That's right. And I'm praying, I'm praying the day happens that when God shows up in our church, that He shows up in such a way, He messes up all of our ideas, even my own, of what church is supposed to be like. Amen. That He shows up in such a way that all of a sudden we come in here on Sunday morning and, this, and I end up preaching and then we have worship at the end. Or we end up going in and oh my goodness, we get into a, a worship song and next thing you know, we didn't even have preaching because the altars of God filled the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit shows up and all of us were sung. Yes. Amen. All of us, for one reason or another, has fallen under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and realized our own need for Him. And I'm not talking about we need to get saved. I'm talking about the fact that we have a new revelation or a new understanding of the depths of His forgiveness and grace for our lives and it causes us to run to yeah. the altar. Amen. Some of us need that in our lives. Some of us, you know, we, we, we've been saved 40 years, 50 years. I've been saved over almost 30 years now. And, you know, and I pray that my relationship and my understanding of God's grace and my zeal for Him never, ever fades. Paul tells us, he said, don't let your zeal fade. Don't let your fire die. Don't let it happen. But it's easy to do if we allow ourselves to get into a routine or to get into a rut. But we can never lose focus of the depths of His forgiveness. And you know when the Holy Spirit moves upon us and the Holy Spirit begins to take control and He begins to do what He does best, all of a sudden we begin to have the first revelation we begin to have is the need for God in a greater way. Yes. Yeah. And I'm telling you this morning, we need God in a greater way. That's right. Some of us, unfortunately, are so comfortable in our misery, we'll stay in our misery instead of praying for and seeking deliverance to get out of it. Why? Because it's so familiar to us. It's so comfortable to us. And out as a result of that, we'll stay right where we're at. But some of us are so mad and sick and tired and fed up with the mess that we're in, we're willing to do anything that we have to do to get a hold of God to see change happen. Yes. Yes. But we have to make that determination. God cannot make it for us. The Bible says, He that hungers and he that thirsts, not he that sits and waits. He that hungers, he that thirsts after righteousness will be filled. 
So what does that mean? That means I have to seek, I have to run after, I have to pursue. I have to say, God, you are number one. I want you more than anything in my life. I'll show up to Bible study. I'll show up to church. I'll show up to prayer. I'll get involved in witnessing. I'll do whatever I have to do in order to hunger and, and search and seek and pursue after you because I want an outpouring in my life. Mm -hmm. Some of us say we want an outpouring, but our actions speak different. Our actions and lifestyle speak totally different. <clears throat> but when we get a hold of God and we say, God, I want you, and we align with obedience. Because the scriptures clearly tells us that God, how does he want to be loved? He wants to be loved by our obedience. That's the expression of love that we have for him. When we begin to line those things up, my goodness, what God does. <laughs> I wish this was my phrase, but it ain't my phrase. But here's a phrase that I love a lot. We can never expect to gain what we've never had if we are not willing to do what we've never done. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. We can never expect to gain what we never had if we are not willing to do what we have never done. We've got to get out. Get out of the thing, get out of the box and say, God, whatever, show up, do whatever. The third thing, it is not. Although it is emotional, it's not based upon emotions. A move of God will be very emotional. I'm sitting in my garage the other night and, and uh, I'm watching a video from a friend of mine. He does a, a group called Hope Over Heroin. And oh my goodness, it was amazing. They had they had thousands of people at this outdoor event. People were getting saved one after another. And they they literally put a pool, uh, above small above ground pool in the middle of this park. And as people were getting saved, because you know the Bible doesn't say repent and then go to a baptism class and then get baptized. It says no repent and get baptized. And so what they did is they had these pastors out there. People were getting saved and they would turn around and make a profession of faith right there and baptize them. And there were literally one after another. And I'm sitting here watching this video, one after another getting saved and one after another getting baptized. And these pastors were baptizing these people. And I'm sitting in my garage and, and I'm sitting there with the dogs and watching this video and the tears just start streaming down my eyes. And I told Richard last night at dinner, I said, Richard, I said, you know, I said, when it comes to reaching St. Joe, I said, it's almost a do or die for me right now. Mm. I said, I want to reach our city so bad, it's a do or die. It's not a matter of if, it's not a matter of and, it's not a matter of but. And if anybody gets in my way, I'll plow right over because I want the kingdom of God and I want sinners saved. Amen. You say, well, that kind of sounds a little bit aggressive. By God, you better believe it. Because Jesus said that the shepherd, if he lost one sheep, he'd leave the 99 to go seek after the one that's lost. So what does that mean? That means from the shepherd's heart, he's going to run after that one that's lost. He's going to, there's a desperation there. And we've got to have that desperation inside of us that says, you know what? Yeah, it's emotional. It's emotional when I'm sitting in the garage and I'm watching these people that are getting saved or getting wild baptized and tears are streaming down my eyes and I'm crying out to God, God, I'm tired of dead church. I'm tired of church as usual. I'm tired of the way things are in St. Joe. I'm tired of the way things are in my church, in my home, in my family, and everything around me. I want an outpouring. Yeah. I'm tired of seeing people sick. I'm tired of people struggling. I'm tired of people going from addiction and back to addiction again and not seeing genuine deliverance and genuine healing in their life. It's not up to me, and I know it's not up to me, and it's up to God, but it is up to me in the sense of pursuing Him and saying, God, I've got a hunger. God, I've got a thirst. God, I've got to quit playing games. God, I've got to get out of the way. God, I want that here. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, yes, it's emotional. Believe me, it's emotional. But the question we have to ask ourselves, am I really, really hungry or am I playing games? Am I verbally saying one thing but my actions are doing another? Am I spinning? Do I know I need to be in the Bible but I don't read it? I ain't read it in a week. 
Do I know I need to pray, but I, I can't even spend five minutes a day with the Lord? Do I know I need to fast, but the last time I gave up something I can't even remember? I know I need to witness, but I can't even remember the last person I talked to about the Lord. We got to quit playing games, and we got to get real, and we got to get genuine with ourselves and with God, and say, God, if I really want this, I've got to do what I've got to do and do my part. Yeah. I don't want to be like the Laodicean that was lukewarm, and Jesus said, "I'd rather you be hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because I can't stand you." Read Revelation chapter three sometime. God doesn't like lukewarm Christians. He doesn't like Christians that's got one foot in and one foot out. He spits them out of his mouth because they taste terrible to him. You say, man, that's hard. Read Revelation chapter 3. That ain't my words. John wrote that. It's emotional. See, dryness and deadness is no sign of being spiritual. A frown on my face, being pious. Those things aren't. That's no sign of being spiritual. That's a sign of being lifeless. That's a sign of, of an absence of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So what is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? You say, okay, you're giving us some things. These are pretty strong things. But what is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Well, first thing is personal. It's personal. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit when it begins to happen in our life and we begin to hunger and thirst after God, it creates a lifestyle of repentance that leads to conviction and holiness. Boy, I would love to see the day when Christians have a backbone and will stand up for righteousness. That's right. I live for the day when the homosexual agenda is not a homosexual agenda anymore, but it goes back to the Word of God and people are finding deliverance. Yes. I live for the day when all this junk that is going out there and promotion and legalizing sin in different ways and different manners, that people go back to the Word of God and stand up for righteousness. Mm. Stand up for holiness. Not because we're legalistic, but because it's godly. Revive when outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What is it that leads back to a lifestyle of conviction, a lifestyle of holiness? Matter of fact, when you read through all of Jesus' messages, one of his main messages was what? Repent. Mm -hmm. Repent. John the Baptist, what's his message? Repent. You go all throughout the book of Acts. What's the main message? Repent. What is, what is the beginning of what is the beginning of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? We've got to first make it personal and get our eyes off the fact that everybody else around us needs it. Mm -hmm. Yes, everybody else around us needs it. Believe me, I know. When you're out on the streets and you're talking to people or you're knocking on the doors and you see things that you shouldn't be seeing, I know that there are people out there that need it. But until we make it personal, until we realize it's got to start with me, until we realize the outpouring's got to start in my heart and my house, that I've got to be the one praying, I've got to be the one fasting, I've got to be the one in the Word, I've got to be the one repenting, I'm the one that's got to be changing. Until I make that personal in my own life, we can never expect God to do it out here. That's right. We've got to make that personal. Acts 2, 3, 38 39, Peter says this. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Acts 3.19, again, the message is, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come upon you in the presence of the Lord. You know, we want the presence, that is interesting to think about that, we want the presence of the Lord among us, but we've got, the first command here is repent. Repent. Be converted. Turn away from your sins. Say, I'm not going to show up and do that anymore. I'm not going to go off the mouth like that anymore. I'm not going to go and be involved in those messes that I'm not supposed to be involved in anymore. But I'm wanting God to move in my life because I need a refreshing. I want the presence of the Lord to refresh me. It's a lifestyle of repentance. The personal part of this is a lifestyle of prayer. Acts 1 and 14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So what is going on here? They're, they're up in their upper room in prayer. They're in prayer for 10 days. When was the last time that you got so desperate for a move of God in your life you spent 10 days in prayer? When was the last time you spent a day in prayer? Hmm. 
You're saying, oh, you don't know how busy my schedule is. Clear the calendar and make it, make it priority. <laughs> yeah. You can't give God one day that you're just too busy. You hear what I'm saying? If you can't give God one day, then you're just too busy. You're saying, oh, you don't understand because it's easy for you to say you pastor full-time. Believe me, I used to pastor full-time, work full-time, be a master's degree full-time, and coach a soccer team, but I still made time for one day a week to be with my Lord. You're saying, well, that's just you. Well, yeah, you know what? It may just be me. But you know what? One thing I learned through that is discipline that if God is a priority, I make Him a priority, He will give me the strength and the ability on the other six days to do all that I was able to do. Hallelujah, yeah. He's got to be a priority. They made Him a priority. Acts 2, 1 and, through, 1 and 4, after they spent this time in prayer and supplication, this is when the, the Pentecost happened. This is when the outpouring happens. Acts 2, 44 and 46. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among them all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, listen to this, daily, with one accord in the temple. What are they doing in the temple? They're breaking bread from house to house. They ate, with their, they ate uh, their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. What were they doing? They were praising God and having favor with all the people. Why? Why? Because they were spending intimate time with God. Listen to this verse, though. I love the latter part of verse 47. Because they made God a priority, and they were spending time in prayer. They were spending time in fasting. They were hungering and thirsting after God. Look, listen to what this says right here. And the Lord added to, to the church daily those who were being saved. Those who were being saved daily were added. Acts 4, 24 and 31. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David had said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The, king, the, the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of, our, uh, name of your holy servant, Jesus. So the praying Threats are coming against them. They're praying. Listen to what they said. This is what happens here. Is they're crying out to God. There's a desperation here. There's a desperation. It's personal. They're making it desperate unto God. The scripture says in verse 31, And when they had prayed, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Acts 5 and 12. And through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people and they were all of one accord in Solomon's court. Again, the one accord talking about prayer. Last two things. We make it personal. The next thing is about community. It's about community. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit is about community. It's about making it personal, our desperation after God. But then it's also about community. It's, made, it's about community because it's a genuine concern for the lost through outreach. The absence of outreach to the lost is an, is an absence of obedience to the commands of Scripture. That is clear as can be. But listen to this. An absence of reaching the lost is evidence of a self-centered church. We all read a book a while back. And I read it when I first started here. A powerful book. One of the things that he talks about in that book is about outreach. Our focus. We look, we find all kinds of different scriptures on that. But in Acts 2.41, and I read earlier, see, they were searching and pursuing and hungering after God, and God began to add to their church. The threats began to get intense because I guarantee you, when you start doing something for God, there are going to be people that are going to talk about you. That's right. Believe me, they will. 
<laughs> when you start standing up for righteousness and you start doing the things of God and what God is wanting you to do and you start standing <laughs> up for His Word, there are going to be people, religious people, church people, that are going to say things about you. There's going to be people that are going to get to the point they're either going to love you or they're going to hate you. But you've got to have the backbone to stand the ground in the purpose and will of God and say, I am pursuing after Him, I'm hungering after Him, and I'm doing whatever He wants me to do because I'm called to the higher calling. And the higher calling of Jesus Christ is not that I can just be saved, but that I can share the gospel to the world and all those around me. Amen. And I know that when I do that, He will add. He'll add. But I love what Acts 6 and 7 says. <clears throat> All of a sudden, because they began to do this and it became part of their lifestyle, the praying, the fasting, the going to church, the obedience of reading the scriptures, living a repentful lifestyle, because they're doing all these things and are pursuing after God, God quits adding to the church. You're like, uh oh, why did he quit adding to the church? Because when you get to Acts 6 7, he quit adding and he started multiplying. Oh, praise the Lord. Think about that for a second. You want multiplication? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want multiplication. Mm -hmm. Addition is fine. I love seeing addition. But I want multiplication. I want, I want God to pour out in such a way that one week we got five people on the second row, and then the next week he multiplied it by three, because you know I'm just saying there's three in the Trinity. And so now there's 15, <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's 60, and then all of a sudden, you know, this keeps on going, 180, and it keeps multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Why? Why do I want that? Am I caught up in numbers? I am caught up in numbers. I'm caught up in numbers because I know that if there's one soul sitting on this seat today that is listening to the gospel message, and that they have had the opportunity or they have given to the opportunity of accepting Jesus Christ, that's one less person that's going to hell. Yeah. So am I caught up in numbers? You better believe I'm caught up in numbers. Because the more people I know that fills a room that is hungry and thirsting and, and, and going after God, the more people I know that are saved, more people that are searching after Him, the more I know that not just I'm doing my job, not just as you're doing your job and reaching our community, but those are that many less people going to hell. And how many wants a whole room full of no going to hell? How many wants a whole city of not going to hell? You're saying a whole city. Don't forget about Jonah now. The Bible says all 100,000 people repented and gave their lives to God. We don't have 100,000 people in St. Joe. We got like 75, 80,000, something like that. So what does that mean to me? That means if God created a miracle of 100,000, it ain't nothing for him to commit uh, create a miracle of 75,000 or 80,000. Amen. We just got to believe it. We got to believe what he's wanting to do. So it's a genuine concern for the loss. It's a unification and growth of the body of Christ. It's a bringing the body of Christ together. It's not about us. It's about the kingdom. The last one, and this is it. It's about the kingdom. So it's personal. It's about community. And it's about the kingdom. It's not about the church. It's about the kingdom. And the, and the kingdom, a confirming, a, confirm, a confirming of God's word through miracles, signs, and wonders. We find this all throughout Scripture. John, uh, John 14, 12, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Now, we know Jesus has been doing a lot of stuff. But he says, whoever has faith in me, Jesus tells his disciples, whoever has faith in me, you will be able to do what I've been doing. But listen to what he says. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Wow. So what are, what are some of these? Mark 16, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name will cast out demons. They, anybody who will rebuke the demon? <coughs> Interesting experience. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Acts 14 and 3. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by an enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. 1 Corinthians 2, 3, and 5. And it came to you, I came to you, and I did not come to you, I'm sorry, I came to you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. This is what Paul is saying. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive, persuasiveness of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and power.
power. Why? Why was so Paul so caught up in his demonstration of the Spirit and power? Why is it so important that we not have dry services, that we have powers packed services, that we have services when someone comes in, they can feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit so thick that they either run to the altar or they run away? <laughs> why is it so important? This is why. In order that our faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Amen. I don't want someone getting saved because they heard me preach. I want someone getting saved because they fell under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they seen their need for forgiveness and now they've given their life to Him. Because if they do it because I've asked them to, if they do it because they want to join the church, they're going to go straight to hell and go right out that door living the same way they came in. But if they come in here and they say they fall under the power of the Holy Spirit and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and realize their need for God. Yes. I can't do that. But when that happens, they're going to walk out the door so hungry and so on fire for God, they're going to ask, what's next? <laughs> Amen. What's next? What's next? Let me ask you a question. What's next for you? What, what's next for you? What, 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 what's next? What are you going to do? Where are you going to go with all this? What are we going to do with it? You know, we've unraveled this can or, or this uh, uh, message or whatever you want to call it. We've unraveled this and we know that it starts with a life of repentance. We know it. We have to make it personal. We know it's about the community and the kingdom. But what, what next? What now? We know this. We've heard this. We read it. We've got the scripture verses. I've given you a ton of a ton of scriptures to back up what we're saying here and, and, and teaching you and showing you the steps to this. But what's next? What do we do with this? Repent. We go back to the first step. We say, God, I need you. God, I want you. God, I, I want you to pour out your spirit here in such a way that it takes all the wisdom and understanding that we have and it defies it because it's human. I repent because God, I, I've been caught up in my own ways and my own thinking. God, I even have control issues. If I'm not involved, if I don't have my say in it, then it's just wrong. I got to get out of the way like you do it. That's right. God, I, I can't go forward. I can't go backwards. God, I can't even stay where I'm at without your spirit. Without an outcome. Without the need of knowing you're here. Knowing that you are moving among me. Moving inside of me. Moving through me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That we repent and we say, God, forgive me that I don't have the desperation. I don't have the hunger that I need. I'm not reading my Bible like I used to. I'm not praying like I need to. I'm not fasting like I need to. God, I come to church on Sunday, and on Monday I'm going around cussing like a sailor, going to the bar and getting a drink. Or I'm going out here and I'm, I'm watching things I'm not supposed to be watching. I'm flying off the handle. And God, I can't do this no more. God, I'm tired of living that hypocritical life. I've got to make it right. I've got to either be in or be out. But I don't want to be lukewarm because lukewarm tells me in your word in Revelation 3 that that just makes you sick. So sick, you spit it out of your mouth. God, forgive me for not being so desperate for the lost around me that when I'm in line and someone's got a bad attitude, instead of me loving on them, I just get an attitude back instead of showing them the love of Christ. You're saying, preacher, you're really hitting home. Good. Good. Because until we make this personal, Until we make it deep, we can never expect an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God wants to pour it out. God wants to do what we've been desiring, what we've been wanting for a long time. The question is not whether God is willing. The 
question is, are we willing to get real and genuine with Him and become desperate? Father, I thank you this morning for your love and your grace. I thank you this morning because I know you're faithful. Father, just like the symbol of communion, Lord, the broken body and the blood that was spilled out for us is a constant reminder of what you've done for us on the cross. Father, it's such a deep, deep thing. Father, as we look to the crosses that are symbols around this, this altar area up here, God, and we're able to focus on those crosses, it's able to take us back to those moments in life where we know that we've been in need of You. But Lord, somewhere, some way, Father, as a church in general, as me specific, as others are specific. Lord, somewhere that desperation has been lost. Somewhere, Lord, that hunger has been lost. Somewhere, God, that, that cry inside that says, I want to do, willing to do whatever I've got to do to align myself up and to be able to watch God do what He wants to do in my life. Somewhere, Father, that has it, it, it's been shaken. It, it's, been, it, it's been neglected. It's been pushed down. It, it's... God, somehow or another, I've gotten so caught up in the world and so caught up in things and so caught up in busyness and so caught up in things that, that are going on around me, God, that I have lost sight and I've lost focus of you. Of you. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the conviction. I thank you this morning, Father, because I know that you sent that promise to us, the Holy Spirit. I thank you for your Son, Father, that paved the way so that we can have access to the promise, so that we can live the life that you've called us to live. You've not called us to live dry. You've not called us to live bored. Lord, Christianity is not boring. And God, anybody that's saved that says that Christianity is boring, sometimes I wonder if they're even saved. Because I have never been bored in my walk with you, mm -hmm. ever. But Lord, I know that there's time we can lose that fire and that genuineness inside. And I ask this morning, Father, if any of us in here, if we're at that place, God, or we've been at that place, God, and we've, we've, we've lost some of that fire, we've lost some of that gunk, we've lost some of that conviction, Father, and we're not pursuing you the way we need to pursue you. Father, I'm asking right now that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would grab a pull on our hearts in such a deep way, God, that we not be able to leave this place this morning the same. But that something would shake us inside. Yeah. And Father, if we don't make it right here, right now, if we don't make it right this morning, that when we leave this place, that that shaking that occurs in the, us yeah. this morning in here, God will literally drive us to our knees this week. Father, we don't want revival. We don't want an awakening. We want an outpouring yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We want a move of you in our community, in our homes, in our lives. Father, we have loved ones that aren't saved. And God, because of our games, they look at our life and they call us hypocrites. Well, Lord, maybe we are a hypocrite because we've not been genuine. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. God, make us desperate. Make us desperate, God. Make us desperate. If you're here this morning and you're saying, I don't know Jesus Christ, that's the first place you've got to start. The first place you've got to start. You're saying, well, you took this a little long this morning. That's okay, that's good. Make God a priority. Time will priority. You're here this morning and 
you don't know Jesus Christ, that's the first place you got to start. It's saying, God, I, I've got to make it right with you. I've got to get my life with you. You know, God forbid that those three teenagers that died on our band this week, that any of them did not know Jesus. Mm. I guarantee those three teenagers were not expecting to be going down the road. They were going to a youth convention. They were excited. They wanted to have a good time. They were looking to have a good time. And because of a simple blowout, today there's three teenagers that are standing in heaven. You don't know when your time is. But I do know this. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can make things right with God. Today is the day that you can cry out to God and say, God, forgive me. I, I'm a sinner. I need to repent of my sins. I need to get right with you. And if you're here this morning, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to do this. You know, I, I want you to be bold. And I'm asking you to be bold because there's a desperation inside of you. If you're here this morning and you're saying, I've been playing games. I don't know God like I need to know God. I have got to get this stuff right. I'm tired of dealing with the mess inside of me. It's like a war going on inside. I'm going one this way, another minute the next way. You know, people are looking at my life. And, and, and I, it's just, it's, part, it's become a burden for me. If that is you this morning, you're saying, I've got to get my life right with Christ. I want to meet you right here. I want to pray with you. I do. I want to pray with you. Anybody in here? Yeah. Don't let pride hold you back. Spirit. Pride is what got the devil thrown out of heaven. Don't let pride mm -hmm. hold you back. Coming to the Lord requires humility. Right. Requires a letting go of ourselves. Right. Anybody in here this morning? Father, I pray right now, Father, you know every heart that's here. Yeah. Every heart that is here. God, you know in here who's playing games, who's not playing games, who's genuine. Yeah. God, who's dealing with stuff in their life. Father, I know this morning there's a few that needed to respond. I, I just know. It's, it's like you just it's showing me yeah. certain people. Yeah. I just, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Father, it's between you and them now. God, the day is the day of salvation. And God, I pray right now that you would just bring them under conviction, God, until they get to the place, Father, where they're saying, oh, I'm all in. Yes. I'm all in. Yeah. I'm not playing games no more. I'm all in. Yeah, I'm getting it back to where it's supposed to be. I'm not playing these games no more. Father, maybe someone didn't, that doesn't know you at all. Lord, this week, you're going to bring them, even maybe on the way home today, church. They're going to fall under such a heavy conviction that they're going to say, God, I've got to have you. Yeah. And when they pull over on the side of the road and give their lives to you. Yeah. Father, we're wanting an outcome. We're believing for them. We're desperate for them. we go into this, this song, this last song here, uh, you all want to go to the last song before. Uh, I'm going to open the altar up. And there's no, there's no shame in coming and praying. The altar's not about coming to join a church. The altar's a place of sacrifice. It's a place of laying it down. And if you want if you want to come up and make a prayer this morning, I'd love to pray with you. If you've got something going on, healing or whatever, I'd love to pray with you.